my name is Jason Kelsky, and this is uh, a webinar I've put together just called How to Ask Good Questions. And uh, it's a theological philosophy of asking questions for the glory of God and the benefit of mankind. We're going to talk about classical conversations, and we're going to look through the um, the heartbeat of what CC is. But before we do that, we're going to uh, look through a couple of other things. So here's our agenda for the meeting. Um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about me, and ultimately the question is, why should you listen to me? And I think you should. Uh, then we're going to talk about a simple theological philosophy of asking questions. We're going to look at the personality of asking questions, and we're going to talk about basics of asking questions. Those are some rules, not rules so much as they are, um, little little uh, tips and stuff that I've learned through CC and why I think Classical Conversation CC is something that people should join. Um, I think along the way, this is going to help would-be directors or people who want to lead in the challenge program because uh, you'll see, I think, the heartbeat of what CC is, what I think the heartbeat of uh, the scriptures are, and then also uh, you'll pick up some things along the way. The last thing we'll talk about if we get to it will be uh, questions to hack the brain and learning. All right, so let's get started. Uh, who am I? I'm Jason. I think that you should listen to me. I'll tell you why I think you should listen to me. Um, first of all, I'm a follower of Christ, and I think that listening to Jesus is the most important thing anybody buddy can do with their life. Um, CC is unapologetically Christian, and I am also unapologetically Christian. Um, I think the wisdom of the scriptures are for us to base our base our lives off of, and so that's a reason you should listen to me. Uh, I'm husband Ali. Ali is here with us. Wave, Ali. That's my wife. We've been married for 21 years. And uh, also, I'm a father to eight kids. As you might know, as parents, you are continually asked questions. Uh, for most people, if they have two to three kids, which is the average in America, those questions go away. For us with eight children, it doesn't ever stop. And so we get repetition, 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 which is really a cornerstone for learning. Um, at any rate, uh, next, uh, I served in ministry as a children's pastor, a youth pastor, a worship pastor, and a senior pastor of a church. I did that for nearly 18 years. I uh, have dealt with uh, extensive uh, situations in counseling and leadership and training. Um, when I stepped away from ministry, I did so for theological reasons, and my, my theology just changed, frankly. Um, and so um, five years ago today, actually, I started consulting with a sales training software company. Uh, it's owned by um, a CC dad actually here in the San Antonio area. And uh, we get along great and love working for that company. I've worked, uh, because of that company, I've worked with Fortune 500 companies, Fortune 100 companies, Fortune 20 companies. And one of the companies that I work for is actually on the Fortune 5 list um, currently. So um, at any rate, that has helped to develop a lot of the skills that I have uh, and that reasons why I think what I have to say is is important. Um, next, I've been a support representative for Classical Conversations since the fall of 2017, and in that process have trained and helped directors to get uh, through this whole idea of what does it look like to lead people. Uh, I was also an essentials tutor for two years um, prior to being an, a support representative, and then I was a director from Challenge B through Challenge 4, um, all the way through with my oldest son who's here with us. Um, and then to, this year is my first time to repeat a year. I'm directing Challenge 3, and it's so much nicer when you have already gone through the information uh, to be able to lead people. So that's what I'm doing right now. I want to end with saying I was asked to do this. Uh, Melissa Stackpole is our AR over the San Antonio area. She was told somebody, and when I find out who it is, no, um, somebody told her that I uh, had taught them really well how to ask questions. And so she said, hey, will you put together a webinar for people that have interest in directing or families that are looking at classical conversations or people who just want to improve their skills in relating to other people and communicating? So um, I did not seek out to do this on my own. I would never put my name out there to you know, vie for a, a role like this. I, I find it intimidating. I also find that I'm not an expert and um, I, I was really humbled by being asked to do this. So let's just start in. Um, a simple theological philosophy of asking questions. This is where I want to start. And um, I know that people want some brass tacks. We're going to get there. But I really believe that we need to start with this question. Why should we ask questions in the first place? Why is that important? And uh, as we ask this question, we're going to look at Psalm 92 verses 5 and 6. And they say, how great are your works, O Lord. Your thoughts are very deep. The stupid man cannot know. The fool cannot understand this. 
Now, this is the English Standard Version. The King James Version says the brutish man cannot know or does not know. And as we look at this, it's important. What I want us to see here is that we serve a God who has great works. He's done great things. And we serve a God who thinks. Our God is a God who reasons. Our God is a God who has planned, has done all the good deeds that he's done. He did them for a reason. And if he did them for a reason, if he has thoughts and if he has great works, that means that our God is a knowable God. So if God is knowable, then the question is, how do you get to know this God? And I think the answer to that is by asking questions. So the Bible tells us the Fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. So if we want to grow in knowledge of who God is, we have to fear him. And to fear God means that I do think that there's a holy terror, but I also think that there's a humility. And humble people have a tendency to recognize what they know and what they don't know. And then humble people want to find out how they can learn more. So uh, there's this element of humility and there's this element of recognizing who we are in light of God. And there's also an invitation into the knowledge of God. So uh, that's a, a great starting point for us. And then this is another wonderful verse that I'm sure people uh, are aware of, but Isaiah 118 says, come now, let us reason together, says the Lord. Um, no doubt you've heard this, and this is a, a verse that's used with apologetics. If you've ever gone through any kind of apologetics course or reasoning behind our faith, uh, people say, look, God has invited us to reason with him, to discuss with him, to talk to him, to investigate what he says and what he means. And uh, that word reason right there can mean dispute or argue or wrestle with. It has this idea of conversations that can be kind of messy. So here's a question for us. Um, if we were to have a conversation with God and it were going to be a little bit messy and someone needed to change, who's the party that would be needing to change in that interaction? Uh, we are the ones who would need to change because God is perfect. He's immutable. Um, and so this changing is something that happens in us, and I think that's a process of connecting with him, of reasoning with him, of disputing and arguing and going through conversing with the scriptures uh, about who God is. Now, a reason that this is extremely important, just show of hand, can anybody quote the rest of the scripture? Does anybody know off the top of their head what the next portion is? A lot of people don't, because when this is quoted, that's where it's at, but you know what the next portion is. And it's extremely important for us. It says, let us reason together. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they are crimson, yet will they be wool. God links reasoning and conversations and knowing him directly to our salvation. I would submit to you that a Christian, you cannot be a Christian unless you're somebody who seeks to learn about God. And by seeking to learn about God, you learn about yourself and you learn about this world that you're, we've been created to live in. And it's again, it's directly linked to our salvation. I think that as we ask questions specifically of God, but then also about the world around us, I think that it, it sanctifies us. Uh, I think that there's a, a you could argue that there's a, in a sense your salvation is linked to this. Um, so it's important for us to consider this. Um, so going back to our first question. Why should you ask questions? At the end of the day, you should ask questions in order to know God and make him known. And that is CC's Classical Conversations motto, to know God and to make him known. So you should ask questions for that purpose. And here's another excellent question that I think I, I would love it if people put this question into practice. Uh, what happens if you fail to know God? And, and not just here, but in, in any endeavor that you seek for in life, you should ask the question, what happens if I don't accomplish this? What happens if I fail at this? That's a really important question we should ask. But specifically, what happens if we fail to know God? Well, if we know God and then we make him known, if we fail to know God, then we fail to make God known. And there's a whole lot on the line right here. And so my, my question for us would be, who is on the line? Whose lives are at stake if we fail to know God and we fail to make him known? And I think that that question should pierce the heart of every parent. And we should realize and recognize that our children's lives are dependent upon us teaching them. Deuteronomy chapter 6 says, take these things that I have taught you and teach them. Tell them to your children. Tell them when you rise in the morning, when you walk in the way, when you sit down to eat, and when you lay your head down at night. In other words, all day, every day, teach your children. So we know God, we seek God in order to make him known.
But that doesn't just end in our family, that ends in our communities that we influence, whether it's our homeschool communities, our church communities, uh, our, our extended family, and so on. So this is an important call for us. So why should you ask questions? We'll summarize it real simply again, for the glory of God and for the benefit of mankind. Okay, so let me give you a, a resource, something that was a, a huge help to me. Uh, not, I'm not giving it to you, <laughs> but I'll point out a resource, a book called uh, Questioning Evangelism. It's written by Randy Newman, and the subtitle is Engaging People's Hearts the Way Jesus Did. In this book, Randy talks through, I say it like I know him, I don't know him, but Randy Newman says, uh, you know, Jesus, when he engaged people and was asked questions, he continually just turned the table on them and sa- and followed up with questions. And so he makes the argument that we as um as believers, if we emulate Christ, that means that we also dig in and find out information and we follow up with questions. So uh, I would say that I think I think Christians, a, a quality that Christians should have in, um, is that we are people who are inquisitive, who want to know, want to learn, and who dive into knowing God, but also knowing other people. The personality of asking questions. I'm going to give you a warning here. When you start asking questions, you will likely offend people. You'll push them away and and or you may annoy them. Um, I'm really well acquainted with what this looks like. You can offend people when you ask questions, and we do not want to be a cause for offense when we ask questions. And so there is a personality that we ought to have. That's my premise for us, uh, and we can talk about that more if you have questions about it. But we're going to lay out a handful of things as we discuss what this means. Um, and so w- the first question I want to ask us is this um, regarding the personality. Is it possible to ask the right question without coming to a conclusion or without receiving an acceptable answer? Have you ever asked the right question but never received the answer you were looking for? Thumbs up. Yes. Okay. Now, there are probably a lot more likelihoods of why this happens, uh, but we're going to delve into it with another question. How come? How come it happens that you ask the right question, but you don't get the right answer? And as we answer this question, we're going to talk about uh, two answers that don't worry us, and then we're going to talk about two answers that do worry us or that should worry us. And so uh, what I, what do I mean by that? Two answers that shouldn't worry us. Uh, in other words, once again, I asked the right question, but I don't get an answer. Why might that be the case? Two things that we're not going to focus too much on. Number one is asking the wrong person. So if you ask a plumber to tell you about what it means to be an electrician, they they can't give you the right information. That's not so much a personality issue as it is just learning where to go to find answers. So we're not really going to worry about this one too much. Uh, the second reason that you might get a wrong answer is because you're asking at the wrong time. If you call your plumber at midnight to ask him about the sizes of pipes, he's probably going to be angry at you. It's not the right time. It's not the right time to learn. We're not going to focus on that. We kind of all assume and understand that there are reasons. But I point these out just simply say you should be aware that you need to ask the right person questions and you need to ask them in a timely manner. Uh, so those are two answers that we're not going to delve into. But there are two answers that we should worry about as far as personality is concerned. And the first one is asking the wrong right question. I'll tell you more about what I mean here in just a second, but asking the wrong right question. Believe it or not, you know what that means. And then the second thing is asking in the wrong manner. You might also say the right, the, the wrong motive, but I'm also not worried about the wrong motive because I trust that you're believers. I trust that you want to serve the Lord and you want to uh, do right by what the Lord wants and you want to help other people. And so I don't, I'm not really calling into question motives, uh, but manner or manners or even etiquette. There are things that you can do to help you in the personality of asking questions. And I think that's a a good starting point. But let's address question number one, asking the wrong right question. You know exactly what I mean, because no doubt every single person has asked their husband or their child or their spouse, how is your day? How was your day? And what's typically the answer? Fine. 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 I'm glad somebody said it. How was your day? Fine. Is this the right question to ask? Yes, that's the right question to ask, but is it wrong in the sense that it, the wording is wrong or the, 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 well, we'll just leave it there, the wording. And so my wife does this amazing thing with our kids, and, and uh, I learned this from her, and uh, I have my own question, but we, we try to stop asking this question of our kids, how was your day? Because we always get the fine response. And so instead, we want to ask the question, how can we reword this? And you'll find this is going to come up later when we briefly talk about essentials. That is 
linked to the DNA of classical conversations. We ask that question in the essentials program. So um, just to plug away, right, looking forward. So how can we reward this? Um, bad, how was your day? Don't do it like that. Good, what happened today that made you laugh out loud? Anything happened today that made you laugh out loud? If you ask your kids that or you ask your spouse that, they're going to stop for a second and they're going to realize that this is different, this is new. And they're going to really think about their day and you'll see the wheels turning as you ask this question. Uh, so you want to make sure you're asking the right, right question, not the wrong, right question. Uh, another good example of this question would be what happened today that you wished happened every single day? Right. That's a great question, isn't it? Ask a kid that question and you're going to sit back and they're going to if you ask them like RCC yesterday was or RCC day was yesterday and they're going to say, we wish we got cupcakes and candy for Valentine's Day every day. And if they did, then our dentist bills would be horrible and they already are. And let's pause for a second and just grieve over. It. OK, we're done. So um, that's asking the wrong right question. Thinking uh, through, how can I reword this? Whenever you ask a question, if a lot of times people, uh, in, like in, as directors, they'll ask a good question and nobody responds, and then they move right past that question. Don't do that. Ask yourself, how can I reword this in such a manner to pique interest? And you'll see people go, oh, like you'll see the wheels turning as you ask the right question. So be aware of that. Okay, so the the two th reasons or the two things that do worry us. Number one is asking the wrong right, right question. Try to say that five times fast. Wrong right question. Wrong right. Okay, can't do it. Uh, and the second one, asking in the wrong manner. So we're going to talk about this uh, extensively right now. Asking in the wrong manner. What does that mean? So here's a list of things, and we'll cover each one. Uh, being an interrogator being disinterested, being absent-minded, being predictable, being a know-it-all. This is what I'm talking about in the wrong manner. So they're not necessarily wrong motives, but the way that you present yourself as you ask questions can cause problems and help you or cause you to not get the answer that you're looking for or uh, to not get people to respond or reply to you. So let's look at these uh, individually. Being an interrogator. What if your kids or spouse don't answer your questions because every time they do, you use their answers against them? Would they want to keep answering questions? How about you? What if I asked you questions right now just to use it against you later? You, this is something you're going to have to continually be on guard with um, in making sure that you ask people questions not for information to use. And the temptation here, this the reason that this is number one is because the temptation here is very real. And you're going to do this anyway. When you increase in knowledge, the Bible tells us in uh, 1 Corinthians, what, chapter Eight, knowledge puffs up, but love edifies. As you grow in knowledge, there's a tendency to become puffed up, to think that you you uh, know everything, that you're better than other people. And so when people make mistakes, we have a tendency to use it against people. You're going to need to fight against this and war against this with everything within you. Don't be an interrogator. Instead, you want to be inquisitive when you ask questions. Really, really take time to be concerned over what you're asking people and help them to know that you're not asking them to use information against them. Uh, next, being disinterested. My wife has this amazing quote that uh, actually I haven't heard in a while. Either I've gotten better or she just gave up. Um, I think I got better. OK, so she. <laughs> <laughs> You're not supposed to laugh, honey. I saw her laugh. She's like, yeah, right. Okay, listen with your eyes. She tells me this. She used to tell me this all the time. Jason, I need you to listen with your eyes. Imagine that you ask somebody a question and you're like, hey, so tell me about your day. So, oh, yeah, that's interesting. Uh, and how and how was that? Right. Don't you feel the tension right there of me asking you, but I'm on my phone. Uh, maybe it's not a phone. Maybe it's uh, cooking dinner. Maybe it's work. Maybe it's something else. Being disinterested conveys something to people that that is um, it's actually very detrimental. It's very hard on the psyche. So be present as you ask questions to those people that you're talking to. Um, being absent minded. What if you were asked the same question day after day because the person asking couldn't remember your answer? Right. Um, that's that's a hard thing to do. People don't like that. People like to feel like you you care and they like to feel like that they're important. You remember that old Nat King Cole song? Wasn't it him? Unforgettable, unforgettable. Uh, 
in every way you're like now i know why you weren't a worship pastor anymore i know it was bad okay so don't be absent-minded pay close attention listen it's helpful to document answers even if you need to get a notepad out uh, and write down answers that you get i actually keep a notepad i thought i keep kept a notepad i have a notepad here on my desk somewhere of things that my wife say says that i find funny or interesting and it's helpful for me to go back and we laugh about things that she said and answers and to questions that uh, i've asked her and it's so much fun for us to go down that trail so uh, i would encourage you keep a journal notate the things that you've learned when you ask people questions again not to be an interrogator but to actually stay present and to recall things. People love it when you recall their name. They love it when you recall things about them uh, that you remember. It's such a meaningful thing and you'll become better at asking questions. People will want to open up to you as you learn this skill. So, uh, and we'll talk a little bit about learning these skills, but really the ba basic thing there is to just practice with people, practice, practice, practice. So uh, finally being predictable. Uh, imagine if you ask the same, same thing at the same time in the same tone. What in the world is going on with this grammatical sentence? If you, okay, no, it's not. If you ask the same thing at the same time in the same tone, it becomes white noise. So as soon as somebody uh, walks in the door, how was your day? They walk in the door, how was your day? They walk in the door, how was your day, right? It, it becomes predictable. And so people can prepare for that answer. And so the default is fine. Uh, so try not to be predictable, ask interesting questions. Uh, and you'll find the more you ask interesting and throw the curveball question, you'll have you'll see people adjust to those responses. Uh, so um, make a list. Uh, one thing that I like to do is I make a list of questions that I want to ask my wife. Uh, and then another thing that we've started to do with one another is we say, hey, I've got a question I want to ask you. I want you to think about it all day long. And so we'll ask a question early and then we'll talk about it a little bit later. Um, so, you know, try to throw some curveballs in there. Now, um, the last one, being a know-it-all. Proximity does not equate to intimacy, okay? Um, and I mean this in terms of, of your children and knowing your kids. One reason people don't ask questions of their kids is because they equate the fact that you're together all the time with the fact that you know them. And so this is a, something that parents really need to fight against and war against. You think that you know your child because you've wiped their bottom from the time that they were little and you fed them every meal and you know what their favorite food is. But all of those things change in the lives of children. Uh, literally, scientifically speaking, when a child goes through puberty, their taste buds change. And so the thing that they liked two years ago, all of a sudden they don't don't like it anymore. Uh, in fact, I remember I used to eat cottage cheese and jelly. What is that mess all about? Ugh. Um, at any rate, I grew out of that, thank the Lord. Um, but nonetheless, being a know-it-all is not helpful. So don't just think that because you're around people enough that you know. Don't take for granted uh, the fact that you've got a real living person right next to you. An example that I'd love to give you and share with you is this idea that uh, I think is helpful for us when we get around extended family. Um, but I heard somebody say recently that that uh, if you think about your parents, as your parents get older, when you get middle aged, they're up there in years, you realize that you only spend three holidays a year, maybe two holidays with them a year. And so when somebody, if the average lifespan is for men, it's like 76 years old. When As soon as your parent gets to about 70 years old, if you see them two times a year and they're 70 and the average lifespan is 76, that means that you're going to spend 12 more times with them. That's really difficult to process through. Call them, talk to them, engage with them. And I'll give you a story around this. Um, not to poo-poo on my dad, but um, <clears throat> my, my grandfather, my dad's dad, grew up in New York on Long Island and uh, he grew up watching the Brooklyn Dodgers. Now, I was an avid baseball fan growing up, and um, you know, my dad and my grandfather taught me about baseball, at least my dad did, but um, I, I've only ever spent maybe a dozen times around my grandfather, because he lived in Florida, just didn't spend a lot of time around him. And one time we were at my dad's house, and I, I said to my dad, or my grandfather, I said, hey, Pop, you, you grew up in New York. And he said, yeah, and I said, did you watch Jackie Robinson play for the Brooklyn Dodgers at Ebbets Field? And when I asked that question, my dad like snapped his head over at my my grandfather. He looked at him and my grandfather was like, of course I did. I'm from New York. And my dad was like, what? You watched him play? You, you were at Ebbets Field, which Ebbets Field was torn down. And I remember thinking, 
how did this, how has this never come up? I was a grown man. How have I never thought to ask this question? What a great question. And then we listened to my grandfather talk about baseball for, you know, and we had this moment where there was a really good connection and all that because you just don't take for granted the the proximity. Don't take for granted that, uh, you know, being close to people. At any rate, we're doing this uh, both for God's glory, for the good of others, and uh, it's it's really also good for yourself as you ask people good questions. So here's another resource. Um, it's called How to Talk So Kids Will Listen and Listen So Kids Will Talk. This book, I um, actually read this when I became a children's pastor because I was so worried about how to talk to kids and how to lead children, and how to lead families and encourage families on how to talk to their kids. And this resource, um, I actually went to a, a public school and I sat down with the principal and just interviewed her. And said, like, I'm a brand new children's pastor. I have no idea what I'm doing. I was a youth pastor, but I have four kids. And people are like, well, you got a lot of kids, so you should be a children's pastor. And it was like, that was not a good idea. And so I interviewed her, and she said, you really need to read this book. And I'll give you the synopsis of this book. Um, The idea is this, is that as you have children, elementary age, it works with older kids too, and it works with adults. I'll tell you that too. Um, But when you work with little kids... They struggle with expressing what they want, what they need, what they desire, all these things that are going on. And so you have to play detective when you talk to them and you have to ask them questions to find out what's going on. So an example would be that your child is throwing a fit. Moms learn this with little babies. You see my little baby there? We Moms go, is he is he gassy? Does he need a burp? Is he hungry? Is he tired? They ask, they go through all these processes. But as your child starts to speak, they don't know how to verbalize that. So you have to verbalize it for them. That's one of the beauties of asking questions. And so you can look at your little three-year-old and go, oh, I get it. You're hungry. And you verbalize it for them. You actually train them to tell you what's going on. A lot of people struggle with communicating with with others. It's partly because we don't clue in. We don't um, read between the lines. We haven't asked good questions to really get to know people for their own benefit. And so this personality thing is really driven at the heart of your children, the heart of your loved ones, the heart of those that you lead. Um, Learn to ask questions, learn to read between the lines and to find answers and solutions so that you can help people make connections. Okay, let's push on to the basics of asking questions. Now, um, some of you might go, why are we covering this last? And when we talk about this, we're going to look just a snapshot at classical conversations and what it does. So uh, I think everyone here is familiar with classical conversations. So I don't think we need to go into all the depth of every every resource and every tool, but I'm going to highlight them really high level for us. But why am I covering this last? And ultimately, uh, the reason I'm covering this last uh, is because Uh, This is practice, and I'm under the conviction that practice comes after your philosophy and your theology are established. And I can give you an example of this. So when you ask somebody about the Ten Commandments, a lot of times they go right into the list of practice. But the Ten Commandments do not start with practice. The Ten Commandments start with, as every CC family knows, going through the Ten Commandments. The Ten Commandments start with God and what God has done, right? Right. Uh, And God spake all these words saying, I am the Lord thy God who has brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. So it starts first with his covenant, what God has done on our behalf. Before you ever get to practice, you should ask yourself, why am I doing this? Because you might find out too late that you're doing it for the wrong reason. So that's why basics and the know-hows and the brass tacks, these these come after our theology, after our philosophy, after working on ourselves and looking at ourselves and looking at ourselves in the nature of who God is. That's why we move to this last. So you can have all the right information in order to ask good questions, but if you don't spend time around people for their benefit and for God's glory, you have missed it. Okay, so I want that to be in our minds. Think first of the glory of God, then the benefit of other people, and then get to the tools. Okay, if you know the whys, if you know the how comes, the tools, you'll want the tools to be put into place. So let's go over some tools. So, um, and this is something I thought of. Maybe I heard this somewhere. I don't think I did. I I like to, to think I coined this, but somebody will tell me that I didn't. But uh, tools are simple to learn, but people are hard to learn. Okay, interacting with people is a very difficult thing. Tools are simple, so that's why we're covering this last. So, uh, but there are tools. So let's look at some tools. So uh, this is why I love classical conversations. Uh, they have systematized 
this process using classical tools. Now, do y'all say systematized or systemize? Because you can use either, but I like the word systematized. It just feels better rolling off the tongue, systematized. I'm getting tired as I'm presenting. Can you tell? So um, the basics of asking questions, um, the trivium. If you want to get good at asking questions, you need to understand the trivium. Just hands down, you have to understand how people learn. And so without going into too much detail here, um, simply put, the trivium is understanding that people learn the, the natural way of learning is through the grammar, dialectic, and rhetoric stage. And that simply correlates to the grammar stage being people learn terminology and then they learn rules um, before they do anything else. So if I was going to teach somebody music, I would teach them terminology. I would teach them scales. I would teach them all the initial basic information, right? They would start locking that away. If you learn want to learn sports, let's say basketball, you're going to learn how to dribble first. You're going to learn how to pass the ball. You're going to learn the rules. Don't cross this line. Shoot from here. Pass it here. All those rules start first. Uh, but when somebody starts learning, whether music or whether sports, which, by the way, this is a Robert Borton's idea. He talked to to me. He actually told me about this in an interview I had with him a few years ago, but uh, he gave this example. So I'm just stealing this from him. But um, as they learn, that's the first place you start. But imagine a kid wants to learn music or they want to learn a sport. Do they feel like they have learned music or sports by learning the rules and by learning the terminology? Absolutely not. The next stage they have to go to is putting into practice the things that they've learned. And so that's the dialectic stage, which is practice, just rolling through things over and over and over again. So for kids that learn the rules in music, that means practicing your scales and practicing your, your songs. Uh, for basketball, for sports, that means doing your drills. That means running around and getting in shape and all those practices. And that's called the dialectic stage. Dialectic, when you hear that, think dialogue. Think that you're dialoguing as you are learning. You're dialoguing with a ball as you dribble it or as you throw it. You're dialoguing with your instrument as you're playing it. You're sitting here telling yourself exactly what you need to be doing as you're strumming the guitar. You're getting muscle memory done. You're conversing with that thing that you're learning. And then the final stage uh, is, is imperative. Any kid, can you think of any child that learns music or any child that learns a sport that is happy just going to practice and just knowing terminology? Absolutely not. They want a jersey. They want to perform. They want to be in front of people. They want a new outfit so that they can go and do their recital. That's what they press to. And that's the rhetoric stage, which is presenting with expertise, presenting with um, a solid understanding of those things that you're doing. This is how people learn. And so as I've just talked about this thing, I've asked you a whole lot of questions to help you to realize, yes, this is exactly how people learn. So anytime you want to teach somebody something, uh, you want to start with asking them questions about what they already know. Then you want to ask them questions about how things relate. And then you want to ask them questions to help them to become better at what they're doing. That's this whole idea here. Now, the trivium uh, is outside of CC's motto. This is the DNA of all of our programs. Again, this I love uh, classical conversations and the trivium is just the fact that we highlight it. It's not CC. Trivium dates back to the ancient world and CC's just uh, jumped on the the ancient world bandwagon, the classical bandwagon. Um, but I say that like it sounds bad if I say it like that. We have harnessed right these ancient tools. Uh, the five core habits of grammar is the next tool that CC gives. Naming, attending, memorizing, expressing, and storytelling. If I'm going to learn about something, I need to be able to identify it. So let's say I want to learn about this tool that's right here in front of me. The first thing I need to do is ask some questions like, well, what is this thing called? And that's naming. What's this thing called? Uh, it's a screwdriver. Okay, cool. Um, I'm going to attend to it. What? What is it? What? Tell me about this thing. What do you see when you look at it? Uh, well, I see a metal shaft with a a uh, cross on the end of it, it looks like. It's yellow and black. I see that there's a name on it, Stanley. Um, it has a handle and it spins really nice. That's kind of fun to spin. So I'm paying close attention to it. That's the attending, but I'm asking questions as I learn. Then I might ask the question about memorizing. Like, can you, um, well, how does memory work? I'm going blank on this. Somebody's gonna have to help me out on memorizing this. I, I, I actually practiced this, but now I'm going blank. Um, I'm gonna memorize what I'm using this for. And I'm going to memorize the fact that I have this screw that's got a flat tip on it. And this one's got a cross on it. So oh, this one's not going to work for me to open that or to unlock that bolt. So I need to remember what the purpose is. Ah, here's another one. Every man in, in the world that listens to this is going to go, go, 
where did I put my <laughs> screwdriver, <laughs> right? Um, memory becomes a process of learning. Um, next is expressing. How would I uh, express? How would I, by expressing, we mean um, using, whether through arts or through body movement, how would you express the purpose of this? Well, very simple. I can twist it the way that it's supposed to be used or untwist it, right? So this is a process of understanding what this tool is. And then finally, storytelling. How can I tell a story about this? Uh, did anybody ever watch Handy Manny? I know my kids did, so my son's over there. It was an old show on, I think, Nickelodeon, where the little uh, screwdriver jumped around and he talked and his name was Phil. Get it, Phil, because Phil, right? You remember that, Aiden? <laughs> so, uh, so you could tell stories about the screwdriver and the complex bolt that he tried to wrestle against, right? These are all the tools that you have at your disposal in the grammar process of learning. And this is uh, what is used in our foundations program. It's a fundamental element of the foundations program using these tools. But the, these tools are just asking questions about what you see in the world around you. If you start asking really good questions or even really basic questions, you can learn about anything, whether it's people, concepts, ideas. You can learn anything if you learn to ask good questions. Um, the five common topics of dialectic. This is an Aristotelian tool, and um, it's very similar to names. Oh, by the way, this the names one, the five core habits. Uh, CC actually did trademark that. That's a product of CC, but the rest of these are all ancient tools. So um, the five common topics of dialectic, definition, comparison, circumstance, relationship, and testimony. Uh, these are exactly the same thing that we've already talked about, but at a little bit of a different level. Anytime you want to learn about people, you want to define, you want to find out what is it, what am I looking at? Uh, you want to compare, you want to take what you're looking at and you want to know what what it is versus what this thing is. What are these two, as we talked about with our screwdriver. Uh, circumstance, you want to find out about um, the different things that are actually circumstances, what caused this, nope, circumstance, relationship, Circumstance are those the the reason that this thing. Why am I going blank right now? I just get the two mixed up. Circumstance are the things that are going around at the same time as right now, right? So, um, what's what's the circumstance of this? Uh, how how did this get here? How did this get onto my desk? Why is it on my desk? Well, Jason thought about needing an example, so he brought it and put it on the the, the desk. Well, what's the circumstance? Why did he need it on his desk? Well, he needed it on his desk because he's using it as an illustration. There's a circumstance. But then relationship would be, what's the relationship of this item to Jason? Well, that's Jason's um, tool. What's the relationship of this to a screw? What's the relationship of this to an other, uh, other tool? Um, would I use this to cut wood? No. Would I use it to break up ice? Yes. Should I use it to break ice? No, because it's dirty and filthy and my wife will get mad at me for putting this in the freezer, but I've been totally tempted to do it in the past. I'm going to stop. So uh, that's relationships. Testimony. Why should I listen to this person uh, wh uh, is, is what we're asking or authority. Why do I need this? Well, I need this because when I get my, my uh, little desk for my kids and I open up the little uh, thing on how to put it together. It says you're going to need this tool. So I'm listening to an authority telling me that this tool is exactly what I need to use. And I'm, I'm listening to the testimony of it. So uh, these five common topics are really just questions and they can be utilized anywhere and everywhere that you need to learn something. So if you want to uh, meet somebody and talk to somebody and find out about them, ask them their name. You're defining them. Hey, what's your name? What kind of things do you like? Ask them how they're related to other people. Just go through these process now, uh, or go through this process. So the five common topics are a core aspect of the entire challenge program. This is integrated in everything that we do in all of the challenge levels. Next, the uh, the basic, um, I'm sorry, the canons of rhetoric, invention, arrangement, elocution, memory, and delivery. Uh, these again are also questions that we ask. I know they're stated as just words and terms. Uh, these are Cicero's tools from his writing called De Inventione or On Invention. And in that writing, he breaks these out and he defines them for us. But invention is asking the question, what can I say? So in this presentation, I sat back and I thought, what can I say? What information do I need to present? And then after I did that, I asked the question about, well, how do I say it? What order do I put it in? And I've already highlighted that. Why did we start at philosophy and theology? What, what's the arrangement? What's the importance of 
the and the value of presenting this information. Next is elocution and style. Like, how do I say this? What kind of stories can I tell you? Was it helpful when I told you the story about my dad and uh, my grandfather in Ebbets Field? Is that something that's going to stay in your mind on why to ask good questions? And so that's elocution is um, is style and it's the beauty of language and the beauty of storytelling. Memory is the idea of um, would this have been as effective? Hopefully this is effective and helpful for you, but would this presentation, this webinar be effective if I were sitting here going? And next, what you need to do is to focus on the five canons of rhetoric as they are tools from the ancient world as Cicero discussed them in his book, Day and Vin. You wouldn't listen to me for five minutes, but if I commit what I'm presenting to memory, and if I ask the question, how can I get into my memory? then that helps me in presenting. And then finally, delivery. Uh, sh how should I deliver this? Should I be enthusiastic? Should I be quiet at times? Should I be pensive? Should I ask you rhetorical questions? Should I pause? All these questions are part of the five canons of rhetoric, and these are a major focus of the Challenge 2 through the Challenge 4 program. Um, finally, I think it's finally, is it finally? It is, the Socratic method. This is ingrained in everything, but you're, you have a very specific place that we see this in uh, classical conversations. But this is asking questions to discover what is true, good, and beautiful. We put this into practice earlier when I showed you a bad question versus a good question. How was your day? That's a bad question. Don't ask how was your day. Instead, we ask, what about your day today? What happened that made you laugh out loud? That's a much better question. When you ask that question, you're going to find out what's true, good, and what's beautiful. But we asked a question there. We said, how can we reword this? So um, the Socratic method is a way for us to ask questions to help us to find out those things which are beneficial, beautiful, good for those who hear us. Do you guys remember um, the movie? It was back in the early 90s. It was called Dennis the Menace. Walter Matthau was in it. He was the uh, he was uh, the old man. I forget his name. Anyway, uh, in that movie, he had this prized flower and the flower only ever blooms like once every 25 years. And Dennis the Menace being the little punk that he is, you know, he causes this problem so that Walter Matthau, what's his name? I forget. Mr. Anyway, um, he doesn't see the flower open. He's waited 25 years to watch this flower bloom. and and um, and so he 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 doesn't see it and he's heartbroken and devastated because he doesn't see the flower bloom. When you get good at asking questions, you're going to be able to see the flower bloom. If you don't get good at asking questions, you're going to miss blooming flowers. You're going to miss things going on in your kids' lives. You're going to miss things going on in your spouse's lives. You're going to miss opportunities in evangelism and leading people. You need to learn to ask good questions because you will literally see people open up in front of you. You're going to see them want to share their lives with you if you learn how to do this. And that's really at the core of the Socratic method. And where we see this in CC, it's the heart of question confirmation in uh, the essentials program. We ask these questions about sentences. What are you, uh, what are the parts of, not what are the parts of speech, but uh, what is the subject? Where do you see the predicate? Uh, how can we reword this? You, you go through that entire thing in the essentials program. So um, Penelope had mentioned earlier, having been an essentials program, it is my uh, experience that essentials tutors make the best um, challenge directors because that question confirmation becomes essential to asking questions in the challenge program. If you've never led essentials, don't let that dishearten you. Um, you know, as you consider going into um, directing, if you are considering, I hope that you would, but um, sit in on an essentials class and listen to how that those questions are asked and watch students start to participate. It's a beautiful thing. Um, a resource for us. This is a free one. We end with the free one, uh, which is classicalconversationsbooks.com. If you go to classicalconversationsbooks.com, you'll find our catalog, and our catalog lays out a lot of the DNA, clearly the DNA of CC, and it talks about why we do what we do, and it lists out all the programs. I'd highly recommend you to get over there and uh, get a copy of this. Uh, if you need a copy, I have copies. We can get these to you. And as you talk about classical conversations with those around you, um, it's helpful to have one of these and to show them and to give them the ability to read all the articles. Now, I have other practical things I can do um, and I can give you like the next thing I was going to talk about are questions that hack the brain. But um, I really want to take any questions also. I can go over these, but do you all have anything? Um, anybody have any questions that we can cover at the moment? This is a super simple one, uh, unfortunately, but on that book that you were talking about, was it 
Is it called Homeschool with a Friend? Oh, no, no, no. This is uh, it's just the catalog. Um, oh, this is, oh, that's okay. just the CC catalog. Yeah. Got it. Okay. My kids ran in at the, the very, as you were talking about. The oh, yeah. No worries. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Allison, I see your hand is up. So you've talked a lot about the classroom setting within CC, um, but I do believe that uh, a well-rounded approach to asking questions, uh, I would like to know in other settings, how do you ask questions? So you find yourself in church, you have um, a myriad of ages, uh, you're a father of eight, you've got, you know, 19 down to a new baby. How do you implement these tools? How do you ask questions with uh, multiple ages, with, with large age gaps? And how do you keep um, people engaged? Yeah, um, that's a great question. Um, can, we, can, I, can we parse that out? Because it sounds like there's at least two things you're asking. One, it sounds like you're asking me, how do I, how do I, purpose to ask questions where I'm at, wherever I go, how do I purpose to do that? And then the second one is related to how do I keep the information easily accessible so that I can talk about it to multiple people like kids? Is that, am I understanding the second portion, right? Uh, just my, my, I guess what I'm asking is, um, not talking over children or talking under adults and keeping keeping it relevant to all uh keeping other people participating in the conversation so we don't check out yeah um so there's a there's a bunch there uh and as you say that i would rather talk under to adults than over children um I'd rather talk under to adults and under over to children. So I would say I'd say that simple answer here is um, as simple as I would be able to break it down would be you have to listen. Um, you have to have your ears open and your mouth shut. And if you're listening and if you're looking and if you're paying close attention, there's there's always things. I'll give you an example. Um, one thing when, um, you know, in pastoring, people struggle with like i don't know what to pray for and i used to get that a lot i don't know what to pray for i don't know how to pray and i remember one day i was praying and when i was praying i was thinking about that question how do you not know what to pray for and it was kind of a shock to me and how do i explain this to people and where i was sitting i was sitting in a sanctuary of of my church and um it was like everything that is in front of us is something to think about and to pray for and sitting there, I was looking in the just in the congregation. Um, I was by myself, but I was thinking about, well, this family sits here and this family sits here and this family sits here. And so I can pray for all of those people. And then I, as I was looking at the platform and seeing instruments, I was thinking about this person. I could pray for their uh, needs here. I could pray for their needs here. I could pray that they'd be better in, uh, musicians. I could pray for them that they would be able to convey messages properly. And And so as you start to think about all the things that are right in front of you, you'll find you can ask questions about every last thing that's in front of you. You can pray for literally everything that's in front of you. Uh, you could pray for if you're driving a, a car around that uh, was made in the last couple of years. You know what, Lord, I pray for the person that put this steering wheel on. I'm just saying, looking at Trish right now. I pray for the person that put this steering wheel on this car today. Right. Uh, looking around um, where you're at, you you can pray for uh, there, there's literally no no limit if you stop and just look and um, pay close attention. So when you engage with people in your church, when you engage with people in your community, just look at the clothes they're wearing. Um, look at what your neighbor is doing in his yard and walk over there and ask him, hey, what what are you putting what what are you putting in your yard for mulch? Like how how do you get such a great green yard? And they're gonna tell you, well, you got to use iron. What iron? Yeah, you got to put iron in your yard. Iron actually helps the uh, the process and. I've asked that question, right? So uh, everything is at your disposal. Ask those questions. Um, ask people what they do. Ask people what they like. Ask people what they enjoy. And then as you, um, I think as you learn information about people, the, the I think the follow-up to that, help me, was um, was with um, 
integrating it, like helping other people. Uh, I, I love that question. <laughs> Tell on myself uh, from the office, you know, can you explain this to me like I'm 12? <laughs> can you explain this to me? Sorry. Can you explain this to me like I'm five? Um, and really asking people that, can you break this down for me in a way that I'm dumb? And I just tell people that up front. I'm not that smart. I just ask a lot of questions and I, for some reason, remember things. And, um, but tell them I'm, I'm not that smart. Help me understand. Um, and I think that that's, those are probably some of the best questions that you can ask people. I'm not, and tell them, I I don't, I don't understand what you're saying. And can you break this down for me in a way that is accessible for me so that I could go and explain it to my kids? In fact, this is uh, one of the questions I ask my challenge students in their blue books. Oh man, they're going to watch this and then they're going to know beforehand. That's not good. Uh, But one of my blue book questions that I ask students is I say, I want you to take this single, single concept And I want you to explain it the way that you would explain it to somebody your age. I want you to explain it to somebody, uh, try to explain it to somebody who's 12 years old. Try to explain this to somebody who's six year old. I want three separate writings on this. Break it down. Uh, And so as you're listening to information coming in, thinking about how can I uh, parse this out? How can I dissect this in a way that is very simple? And I because I think it. I think it was Einstein. One of them made the comment that uh, you can tell intelligence isn't by the the lofty words that you use. It's not by having an extensive vocabulary that intelligence is actually being able to take a very complex idea and break it down to somebody who has no knowledge. So when you get around people that use the five dollar words and they want to talk about extrapolating the extensuation of the like those people are actually well, I'm not going to say what they are. Um, if somebody cannot break it down for you in a way that's easily accessible, they don't really understand what they're talking about. Th- that's my premise after being around a lot of people. So um, that was probably rude. I probably shouldn't have said that, um, but I didn't call anybody a name. So at any rate, um, Penelope was a professor, so <laughs> I was. So way to yeah. go. I feel I'm, I'm judging you right now. Sweet. I love it. I feel the heat. Okay, so um, I don't know why I did that or said that. I can give you some you practical say, tools. You did say that to ask good questions, you needed to be humble. So there was your humble pie. Take a big bite. A, yeah, I know. I'm I'm really, I'm sorry. One um, thing I want to say about, you know, when you said, I don't know, how did you put it? You said, I don't know why I remember all of these things. Um, talking about yourself and how you, you, you ask questions of people and then you remember what they say. But really everything that you've said today leads up to that. We're teaching our children to ask good questions, but pay attention and soak it in. It's not some, you know, surface level thing. It's attending. It's, it's actually engaging with the people in the world around them. Yep. If you will take the time to remember things about people, you will find that you will always ask good questions. I, I think so. Um, yeah. Um, cool. So I can, like I said, I can give you some hacks, uh, things that I use in classroom setting. Is that okay if we do that? If we move to that real fast, I'll try to be as brief as possible. So these are things, questions I think hack the brain. So an example, uh, how to help quiet kids to talk, particularly in a classroom setting, like a challenge program. Okay. So how do you, how do you help quiet kids to talk? This is what I do. I tell them up front. I say, next week, I'm going to ask you this question. And then I give them a question. All right. So Next week, I'm going to ask you this question. And then when the next week uh, comes along, then I ask him that question. But then I always have some follow up questions because I know that if they prepared for that question, then they're going to have a whole lot more information because they spent time digging into it. And I don't even have to know what I don't even have to know the answer to this question to get them to talk um, because they've already been prepared. They're going to have answers uh, for these questions. So the next question I say is, how did you come to that conclusion? How did you come to the conclusion that you came to based off this question that I've asked you? Uh, next question is, did you struggle to come to that conclusion? Was it hard or, or did you find it easy? Um, you know, talk to me about that whole process of coming to this conclusion. Uh, did that 
uh, did this, the question I asked you, did the topic that you were thinking on, did it make you think of a movie you've seen or a book you've read or something that you've experienced in life? Like relate it to the real world and and tell me why. And as I'm doing this, the student is going to easily come up with, well, they, a lot of times they'll easily come up with answers here because they, they live in a real world and they have real experiences and they like to talk about those things. And no doubt when they think on something, it's going to relate to something else. Okay, so those are questions that I ask. Uh, and then I love the, did you find this interesting? And then the follow-up to this, whether they say yes or no, the, always the follow-up is how come? Did you find that interesting? Yeah, how come? Did you find that interesting? No, how come? And they're going to give you some answers, right? Uh, immediately, is the next one immediately? Yes, immediately following this, I ask the class. Your classmate said this, gave this answer. What do you agree with regarding this answer? What do you agree with? You ha ask what they agree with. Do not ask where they disagree. If you ask where they agree with, then the students will start sharing what they agree about and you'll build camaraderie and you'll watch that kid's heart blossom and bloom. If you ask where they disagree, that kid, you're going to watch them suck back close. You're going to, they're just going to shut down on you and they're going to feel like they were attacked. They're going to feel like people don't like them. So don't ask about what they disagree with. When a student was like, well, I don't agree. Well, I didn't ask you about what you don't agree with. I ask you about what you do. Find something you agree with. And what you'll see happen with that student is you're going to see that they, um, uh, their hearts begin to blossom and you'll see connections are made. So then you can ask classmates that follow up question. Your classmate said he or she was reminded of this book, this movie, this experience. What movie book experience came to your mind? No doubt you're going to have a student go, oh, well, I totally thought of that same book. Right. And then all of a sudden, this quiet student is able to link to somebody else and you'll start to see them come out of their shell as they, they go through this process. So that's a beautiful thing to watch um, take place. So. Another question uh, that hacks, uh, gauging students' grasp of a concept. This works with individuals or with groups, and it's really similar to the previous one that I just gave you. Uh, but uh, did what you read this week make sense? Whatever topic it is, if it's math, if it's uh, science, if it's Latin, um, if it's a movie, did what you what you took in this week, uh, this your scriptures that you're reading on a daily basis, did what you read make sense? And it doesn't matter. If the student says yes or no, your follow-up is going to be the same. Well, slightly different. If they say yes, they understood it, then cool. Can you explain to me what you understand to be the main idea? And if they did understand it and they explain back to you what the main idea was, you're helping them to reinforce what they have learned. And so it's going to solidify and calcify in their mind as they tell you back that right thing. If they didn't really understand it and they start telling you what the main idea is, now you found a loop or not a loop, but a hole in their learning. And you can go, oh, but did you consider this? Or did you consider that? So you're gonna identify, engage where they're really at. Do they really have an understanding of it? And those students that don't really have an understanding, if you ask them good questions following up there, uh, you'll start to point out and you'll start to humble them in a very graceful way that they'll realize they may not have all the answers that they thought that they had. Now, if the student says no, when you ask them, uh, what's that question again? Uh, did what you read this week make sense? If they say no, almost identical answer. You say, oh man, that's hard. Can you explain to me what you understand the main idea to be? And they're going to go, well, yeah, like Thomas Aquinas was talking about the difference between nature versus grace. And I don't know why nature and grace are two different things. Great. So you read it. That tells me you read it. But if the student goes, well, it was something about Aquinas. And you're like, well, what about Aquinas? What was his big premise? I don't know. Hey, did you even read it? <laughs> right. So you find out where students are at by asking. And you don't go, oh, man, you didn't read it. You go, oh, you didn't read it. Oh, man, it was so great. Let me help you understand. So these are ways to gauge where students are at uh, and how to follow up and fill, once again, the holes and the gaps that they're at. Um, leading arduous subjects. So uh, the Latins, the advanced mathematics, the physics, the um, what else is in there? Music. For some students, they hate music. They just don't get it. So how do you lead arduous subjects? Well, it's really similar. So I tell the students, uh, um, I say, this concept was difficult for me to grasp. Now, I may, I may um, 
It may not have been difficult for me this last week when I reviewed it, but at some point in time, it was difficult for me to grasp. So I'm not lying to them, but this concept was difficult for me to grasp. I tell them that. So I let them off the hook and go, yeah, this is hard. Students need to hear that this is this is talking so students talking so children listen and listen so children talk. Uh, yeah, it was hard for me, too. Uh, can you try to explain to me what you understood the main idea to be? And as you do this, you're going to find that students will realize, like, well, this may not, maybe I'm not crazy for thinking this is hard. And then being able to acknowledge that this idea or this concept is difficult. Uh, so this will help you to gauge, once again, students and allow you to focus on asking follow up questions as well. So uh, particularly in the challenge program, your job is not to be a master of the information. In the challenge program, your job is to ask good questions so that the students talk. And because talking is how they learn processing through is how they learn they don't learn by listening and so my webinar today i'm sorry i let you down um because i did all the talking um but integrated in it are a ton of questions and i actually rooted a lot of this off of this excellent book um it's called make it stick the science of successful learning and um this one is not for kids to read because they do use some strong language in there um I don't know why they had to use strong language, but they did. But they, he talks about um, the learning curve and how to break the learning curve, uh, which I won't go into, or the forgetting curve, I'm sorry. And then also, how do you calcify information in people's minds is through them talking and through them discussing. Um, more questions that hack the brain. Just I'll, I'll shoot these at you real quick. Uh, did your reading this week make you think about anything outside of your studies? We already kind of covered that one by asking them about movies, books, uh, things that they've heard or learned. Uh, what did you find most interesting about this topic, concept, idea? We also covered that one. Uh, what did you like least about this? What did you not want, uh, not enjoy? Who was your least favorite character? Which person um, in your history that you learned about did you find to be the least um, important or least significant. Uh, where do you think you'll use this concept? You just learned about Aquinas and his stance on nature versus grace. Where do you think that you're going to use this? Will you ever use this uh, is another great follow-up question. Uh, who do you think uses this concept, right? Aquinas, who uses that concept? Where, where do you even see that in the world today? Is it in the world today? Hint, yes, yes, it is. Okay. Um, I don't know why I did that. Next, um, do you did you find yourself giving up anywhere in your lesson? Where and how come? These this is a really great question to help kids um, to process through the emotion that they were feeling and why they might have been feeling it. And if you can help them overcome that feeling, then you might be able to help them overcome learning a difficult task. Uh, did you talk with your parents about what you learned or where you got stuck? What was their response? This is a brilliant question because you find out whether or not mom and dad are helping them with subjects and whether or not you need to go, hey, mom and dad, your student uh, said that they talked to you about it and your response was this or, um, hey, just want to touch base with you and find out are, are you uh, having any struggle with it? And oftentimes, mom and dad are also struggling through some of the information that you're leading students through. Uh, did anything in your lesson bring any scripture to mind? Were you able to detect the Holy Spirit leading you? Did you ask him for help in understanding the material? And then the next question, I love it. D uh, do you thin? Doggone it. I hate grammar errors. Do you think he, the Holy Spirit, was there when this concept was discovered? I love that question. Do you think God was like, what do you think God's role in, uh, in uh, Oppenheimer? When Oppenheimer discovered the things he discovered do you think god was present well clearly he was but let's talk about that let's have a discussion around this do you think he knew what was going to take place how do you think he felt about the massive amounts of lives that would you know um won't go there feels like i just took a dark turn i don't want to take a dark turn <laughs> and then uh last question how does this relate to what you learned in other strands subjects courses uh, challenge programs. That's a really great question to help students to understand the world around them and to gauge uh, gauge things there. So um, that's it as far as my presentation for you. Thank you for being here. Uh, you can follow me on facebook.com slash at the Latinator, youtube.com slash at Latinator, or you can email me jkelsky at classicalconversations.com. This is my shameless plug for myself, but I'm done with that. I'm sorry. Please forgive me for that. And then uh, finally, um, classical conversations. If you have questions about that or want to direct, you can do it. Um, we've got excellent resources to assist you as you consider what that might look like.